Okay, so we had BKFC, Knuckle Mania, and UFC Vegas 91 happen, and some other news went down in between, before and after, all of that stuff, so let's get right into it. And of course, starting with Mike Perry, like, main event, Knuckle Mania, we're waiting to see him come back, he's been so dominant in BKFC, like, this has been his, like, shining moment of his career, if we're being honest, like, UFC, he's had his ups and downs, he was popular, but now in, in BKFC, he really found, like, his stardom, like, his, his true stardom, and he can fully express his true self in BKFC, inside and outside of fighting. We come into this main event, and then within seconds, it's over, like... I'm not, I guess I'm not surprised because it's, it's bare knuckle fighting, but at the same time, it's like, damn, like maybe we, you know, maybe we could have got a little bit more, but that one clean shot, that's all it takes for Perry in BKFC. For whatever reason, there is a massive difference in bare knuckle when Perry gets hit and then when he lands on you. Both guys were thrown back and forth, but when Perry landed clean, it was over. And it's crazy because he's at the point where he's literally saying, like, I'm suffering from success. Like, I'm trying to find guys who are even willing to come in here, let alone giving me a real challenge to beat me. The two names that came up were Darren Till and Nate Diaz. Nate Diaz obviously fighting Jorge Masvidal. We'll see what happens after that. But with both those guys, you know, they want to do their things their way and their promotion. I don't see them. And, you know, even Perry doesn't really see them crossing over. And Darren Till, the person that everybody wanted to see in this fight, he even said himself, he's like, I don't want to deal with Mike Perry in bare knuckle. I'll do boxing, regular boxing with the gloves, but no gloves. I don't want to do that. And Perry even said that Till was offered over $2 million for them to fight. And Darren Till turned it down because he didn't want to do it in bare knuckle. The thing is, you can find guys to fight Mike Perry, but are those people at the same star level or higher than Mike Perry? Hopefully we do find that person or at least someone who's going to give him more of a challenge. Even Perry said afterwards, I want to give more of a show. I want to give more action for you guys. But I'm putting these guys out. It's amazing that after leaving the UFC, he was able to find a new home in combat sports and be bigger than he's ever been. And making more money than he's ever made, apparently the purses came out and he made 600000 base alone. And if you compare that to UFC 298, Volkanovski is the only person to make more than that. Perry could not be in a better position than he is right now. But talking more about the knuckle mania, you know, a lot of what happened was short stoppages and kind of weird stoppages. Like with Ben Rothwell, he gets one exchange in and then the fight's over. And he's like... I don't know what the hell happened. I wanted to do more. I wanted to give you guys more again. And it's just like, I hit this guy and he just, he was done. He waved it off himself. And then you have Hunt, which was a wild stoppage because he gets hit with a clean uppercut, which we've seen before. He gets dropped. But as he's dropping, because he was stunned, it, it seemed like that he was kind of like, waking up as he was falling so we tried to extend his hand last minute and then that's why it snapped if he just dropped normally it would have been fine and probably would have been able to recover but because he was last minute trying to recover from that fall he extends that arm which is a big no-no because then <laughs> snaps and it just looked so bad you knew it was over from there and it sucks because that could have been a longer fight a better fight but then because of that clean shot and because of the way he fell snapped over and Hunt said he's like I was good to go it was a good shot but you know the arm snaps I can't do anything about that it's done now but the craziest fight of the night was clearly Angulo versus Riggs right away a slugfest from the start but Riggs was holding on to Angulo's hair and throwing uppercuts at him and the ref wasn't doing anything about it the fans weren't saying anything because they were just going crazy for the mania and then we're just watching him pull the hair not even just for a couple seconds but for almost the entire round holding and pulling and yanking Angulo's hair I'm like what the hell is going on but it's just absolute craziness Credit to Angulo because he didn't stop, he didn't complain, he just kept going and throwing punches. And eventually, when they got broken up, Angulo hit him with one clean shot, flatline rigs, and it's over. A massive comeback and karma moment for Angulo to get that done. An absolute barn burner, perfect for BKFC, and I'm glad that Angulo won because if he didn't, then the whole fight would have been riddled with controversy. But at the end of the day, you know, it was a crazy fight, a fun fight, madness. And the right guy got it done. But overall for BKFC, I really like what they're doing because they're making their own unique path in combat sports. You know, their events look different. It looks like their own thing. You know it's BKFC. You know, the, the crowd's super into it. Visually, it, it's unique. So I like that direction that they're going. It feels like another sector of combat sports, which I really like. And one thing that I really like that they've done is that they've created moments. Whether, you know, obviously mostly with Mike Perry, but also with the Bryce Hall thing. They've kind of made a way for themselves to make noise on Twitter, online, publicly, so people know about them. And it's even gotten to the point now, of course, where Conor McGregor is now an owner of BKFC. What's up, Knuckle Mania? Welcome to the big leagues. David Feldman, baby, we did it. This is really big for Bare Knuckle because we know how good of a promoter Conor is. 
and the attention that he can bring to something, you know, really makes this a massive deal. And it's been public that BKFC at times has struggled financially and it's been, you know, they've been very close to shutting it down at times. So having Connor there backing it is going to be a huge boost and kind of like a safety net in a sense for them. And right, now we move on to UFC Vegas 91. Very mid card. Not that I expected anything more, to be honest. Uh, but there were some key things to take away from it. Obviously, first with the main event, Nicolau versus Perez. And Perez, someone who hasn't won in a long time, trying to get back on the winning column. You know, this was a big moment for him. And him coming back, he was putting on the volume right away, putting a lot of pressure on Nicolau. And that was the difference for him in this fight. Him not only pressuring, but also putting on volume. That's when he had his best moments. And early on, we were able to see that putting him against the fence... He was throwing multiple shots. Okay, you block one, block two, maybe dodge three, whatever. One of them's going to land, and he did right on the chin, right on the money, and he folded. It was a bit of a slow start, but as the fight progressed, he noticed. He's like, look, I'm hitting this guy when I throw multiple at a time, and he got him. And the one thing that's interesting was when I was watching, I'm like, that looks really similar to Ilya Taporia's knockout against Volkanovski. And then, of course, I go on Twitter, and someone made a video comparing and showing how close those two knockouts were to each other. And both got it done in the second round, too. So it's just wild. And for Perez, a great way to go back on the win column, coming in as a replacement, getting a big finish. And, you know, now we'll see what's next. And one crazy thing that happened that doesn't really happen ever in the combat sports space is the Octagon announcer being gone and replaced by someone for a couple fights. Apparently, Joe Martinez was feeling under the weather, so they got Charlie to replace him. And she honestly didn't do a bad job. She sounded fantastic. From Dukent, Uzbekistan, Bogdan Zorovich Gusko. And it makes us forget, like, these guys for, like, six hours straight are announcing not just, you know, saying it, but saying it with passion and, and, and loudly to get you hyped up over and over and over again, it's easily possible that their throat or something can get hurt and damaged and then they can't do it. Then for the main event, Joe Martinez came back and you can clearly hear that he was a little bit under the weather, but still, shout out to both for, for trooping it out. And it made me think about Bruce Buffer, how long he's been doing it, how consistent that he's been with the UFC, you know, it's incredible. Then we go to Span and Guskov, and right away this fight gets weird because in the clinch, Span nutshots Guskov. They split them up, they separate them, but then they put them back in the same position that Span had the advantage. So he commits the fault, but then still gets his advantageous position afterwards. Then, literally right after that, he does it again. And it's just like, bruh. But then going into the fight side, he gets ground control, gets ground and pound, dominates that first round. And then we go into the second, Guskov gets his revenge, clips Span, then puts the heat on him and finishes him in the second round. And it just, you know, I don't know if it's karma or whatever, but Guskov to be able to get the two nut shots, get dominated in the first, then the comeback and hurt Span on the feet. Um, it was a wild turn of events. And big shout out and credit to Guskov there. Let me go to Lane and Denise, and it was almost an identical fight because it starts off Lane, great takedowns, puts the pressure, ground and pound, damage. But because he put so much effort in the ground game, he didn't give himself any energy left for the second round and moving on for the fight. He was gassed out bad. Denise was fresh in the second round and put it on Lane to the point where Lane was out on his feet. And then he hit him with that finishing blow. And Lane went down like in slow motion because he was basically already out. And then he gets hit. And he's just like, whoa. It was a funny knockout to say the least to see a guy just go slow mo down like that. Um, but a wild comeback for Denise, a kickboxer getting dominated on the ground. But when he came back up, it was a whole different ballgame. And it just goes to show, like, you know, if you're going to be a grappling heavy guy, you also have to have the cardio to match it because every round starts back up on the feet. Then we go to Pierce versus Onama. And this was funny because I'm looking on Twitter while this fight is happening and people are complaining and talking about Onama's super low IQ because he's piecing Pierce up in that first round. Then in the second round, you know, it's a lot of scrambling, a lot of ground action happening, but... Onama is reversing positions and getting, you know, in advantageous positions, but he's not getting back on the feet where he was doing his best work. He's staying on the ground and, you know, wasting time and his energy there. And then he ends up losing that second round. So it's 1-1 going into the third. But then luckily, Onama turned it around, just stayed on the feet and put it on Piers to get the dub. And it was funny because at the end of the fight, it was like a bootleg Max Holloway moment. They're just swinging, boom, boom, boom. But obviously... It wasn't nearly as good as the Max Holloway one. Obviously, you can't compare those two. But it was just funny that they threw down like that, you know, not too long after UFC 300. Coincidence? I don't know. But overall, for Onama, fun fight, great win. But, 
you know, we got to have him not miss weight next time. So those are my biggest takeaways from UFC Vegas 91. But there was also some news throughout the week leading up to this weekend that I really wanted to talk about. So, of course, McGregor Chandler is happening and people are talking about the insane prices. I'm looking right now at the official link. The nosebleeds are going for twenty six hundred. I get it. It's Connor's comeback. It's been so long. But it's just like, damn. And then the experience from up there is totally different from, from watching. Like, I, I was up there once in the nosebleeds. It was a good time. Atmosphere is great and everything. But very different. You don't get to see a lot because you're looking down. I had I brought binoculars. You're obviously mainly there for the vibes, for the atmosphere, and to just witness it live. Um, but, pff, damn, that is crazy. Honestly, to me, I don't mind. I love watching on TV. So I'm like, all right, you know what? Sit this one out. Watch from the couch. And it's going to be fun either way. So, And the fact that it hasn't sold out yet, you know, kind of shows like they might have put it a little bit, you know, too high. I think ultimately at the end it'll get sold out. Uh, tickets might drop a little bit. But then another UFC event related thing, UFC 304 in Manchester. They're coming back to the UK, but they put it in prime time for America. But the event is in the UK. So for the people that are actually in the UK, in the arena, they're going to be watching it until like 5, 6 a.m. And I literally waited because I'm like, oh, maybe it's a typo. Maybe they made a mistake on the website. And I waited and I waited and I'm looking at the website right now. And it still says the main card starts at 3 a.m. Imagine going to the event. It's like you're going out. People don't even club like that. For me, it makes no difference. But I'm just thinking for the UK fans who are normally already going to be up all night watching the events. They finally get an event back home and they can maybe be like, oh, you're not going to watch it at a normal time. Nope. You still got to be up all night. Even if you go to the arena and you pay those thousands of dollars for those tickets, you're going to be up all night. And I'm also thinking about how drunk are these fans going to be by 6 a.m.? Because they're going to have to be drinking or doing something to stay awake and be engaged in these fights. And especially knowing the UK fans, they're already crazy as is. Imagine how drunk and wild they're going to be by the main event. And then I looked at this tweet and I felt kind of bad because this guy says the trams will stop running around the time of the last early prelim, which means it'll be even hard, you know, possibly to get to the event, you know, with public transit. Then I see trams probably won't have started when the event ends. So then even coming back from the event is going to be hard because there'll be no trams as well. And then he says stranding 23,000 drunk fans 40 minutes walk away from the city at 6 a.m. Sounds like something that could bring only good things. And he's right. Like that could be a massive problem after the event. And I'm thinking maybe the UFC organizes something with the city. So people who are commuting to this event. Uh, it could be easier for them. Then the other side of thinking is, well, these events are so expensive anyways, the people who can afford to go to these events are probably going to Uber or drive anyways. That is going to be super interesting to see how that plays out because of the circumstances. Then something happened regarding UFC 300 that honestly shocked me. Armin Sarukian and Diego Lopez have their fight purses on hold right now and possibly might not even get it ever. For Armin Sarukian, it's because he tried to hit a fan during his walkout. And I'm like, are you kidding me? You're holding this guy's money because he was being disrespected on his walkout when he was hyped up, literally about to fight someone. You have fans coming at him like that. Like, it, nothing even really happened. Like, come on. I get it because, you know, this could lead to possible suing, etc. So they don't want to deal with that and they want to be stern with it. But it's like, bro, like his whole purse for that, you maybe a little fine or something, but the whole purse, that's ridiculous. And then for Diego Lopez, because he hopped the fence. We see guys do that all the time. We see guys backflip. We guys see run out off the cage and run to fans and celebrate. Like, like what? This is Diego Lopez. Why you got to do him like that? It made absolutely no sense to me. I hope both these guys, you know, get their money and get everything sorted. Um, but just ridiculous. Anyways, that's everything I want to talk about from this fight week and this weekend. Uh, BKFC, UFC, all this fight news. A lot is going on. This summer is going to be crazy for fights. Uh, boxing, MMA, everything. I can't wait to see how it plays out. Let me know what you guys think about everything. Put in the comments below, and I'll talk to you guys. Peace out.